Literary Festival. I was asking Kumar, how on earth did you get into this racket? So uh, it's amazing that he's uh, chosen to back nonfiction. Um, and it's, it's really nice to see so many people here uh, to uh, attend the second literary festival. I hope that this grows 10 times bigger next year. Um, with that hope, uh, let me uh, quickly uh, welcome uh, both Kiran and Ajit. And uh, before we get started, I want to throw it in trivia. I want you to uh, answer a question. Whoever answers the question gets a special gift from Kumar. Kumar, are you there? Yes. Okay. So uh, the first trivia is about Ajit Balakrishnan here, who, of course, has been uh, widely uh, known and uh, has been aptly introduced, but out here in the audience, can somebody tell me uh, what university did he go to for his undergraduate study and uh, what subject did he study in his undergraduate class? So, uh, sir, uh, people under the age of 40 will be the first. <laughs> well, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, you, you raise the hand first. Are there any under 40 contenders here? No. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead. And I'm just saying a wide guess. Say it's Stevens economics. No. <laughs> Well, St. Stephen's was the big, big thing those days, but uh, it, it isn't the case. So, um, <laughs> uh, Ajit actually uh, grew up in Kerala, went to the Kerala University and studied physics there, went to IIM Calcutta, and after that, at a time when uh, professional entrepreneurs were very difficult to uh, come by, Ajit co-founded Rediffusion. And that became a path-breaking ad agency at that time. I don't know, Kiran, yes. if you know the famous Jensen Nicholson ad that they created, which said, when you think of... Color, think of us. Yeah. When you think of color, think of us. That's right. It was quite path-breaking. And then, uh, come Rajiv Gandhi election time, uh, Rediffusion actually uh, probably became the first uh, advertising agency to uh, do the public relations makeover for a political party. Actually, bad campaign. We ran 1984 elections. Yes. Isn't it? No, yeah. I remember it was the only ad campaign that the political party ever had. That's right. And from then on, uh, went on to uh, invest 26% uh, equity in a, uh, in a in a company which is not there in its original form today, uh, called PSI Data Systems, which was the first private sector computer R&D in the country which was doing leading edge work for defense applications and so on. And Ajit and his team practically pulled it from the brink. And at that time, I had the pleasure, the privilege of working for somebody who worked for him. So Ajit was my boss's boss. And it's, a, it's a great feeling to be sitting next to him. Uh, so uh, I will ask you a trivia about Kiran in a moment. But Ajit, uh, why don't I start off by asking a question? Um, and the question is, uh, what is the most significant memory of growing up in Kerala? Oh, I don't know when. I think uh, in 59, the communist government got elected. I remember that I, I was 11 years old then, or 10 years old. And uh, it was the first elected communist government in the world. And uh, I, my father was a doctor, my grandparents were doctors, so we were the bourgeoisie, so to speak. <laughs> and I, I remember graphically how things changed, the land reform movement started, and Kerala became what it is today, you know, a very progressive place, etc. That, that's still striking in my mind. You know, that's, uh, so is there a communist in you? I know, I don't, I don't know. I'm a business executive, so how can I be a communist? I can't say that. <laughs> okay, so thank you uh, for that, Ajit. Now, uh, Kiran. So here's a trivia on Kiran. Uh, who in the audience? And you, you have to be able to answer this question, particularly with so many Gen Y people here. Um, when Kiran went to school in Calcutta, what is the name of that school? What school did she go to in Calcutta? And we double the prize this time. <laughs> no? Did you raise your 
Loretta, no. Okay. Oh, I thought you went to La Mar. Okay. So you, you know, you did it. So. Would you identify yourself to Kumar, who is giving away return, return air ticket to Moon? So Kumar, you have to give us those two prizes. <laughs> well, so uh, very fascinating to see, a, a, you know, see a thinking uh, filmmaker like her, who has a very interesting footprint in the sense that you're born in Bangalore. No, uh, yes, born, yes. Oh. <laughs> Just about, because I think Canada. Nobody is just about born. <laughs> Yeah, so you were born in Bangalore, went to Cal, uprooted from Cal, came to Mumbai, studied here, and then finished your formal college in Delhi and came back. So you were one of those very unique people who have done the entire metro scene, you know, with, leaving aside, of course, uh, Chennai. So here's my question to you. Uh, if you were not doing films, making films, what would you be doing? Uh, well, I'd be working in the development sector, I think. It's still something that interests me deeply, and uh, I think I've always, wa I, I did economics thinking that I would do developmental economics later as, uh, you know, um, as my postgrad uh, specialization. But, you know, film and more, more than film, just the arts were my first love, and I decided to pursue that. But if I had a chance, and then I realized, of course, developmental work or work in the social sector doesn't need a degree and certainly just needs intent. So I said I should do what I love because I can always do that later. So I would, if I didn't do film, I would most definitely be working in the social sector. Fantastic. So over to the uh, theme of the conference. Uh, the theme is India, the time is now. Nothing to do with Arnab Goswami. <laughs> And uh, so on that theme, I want to ask Ajit first and Kiran, and then we can go a little bit of back and forth. Is there a mic that you have for the audience later? Yeah. Maybe you can give it to us now with this passing the mic. We'll be able to react. Okay, that's that's good. Thank you, thank you for doing that. So Ajit, here is the thought. You know, we're talking about India. Your time is now. Before we even explore that. Um, it would be nice to know from you, what does the idea of India mean to you? And what does it mean to be an Indian today, here and now, to you? I, I think this year, the past few months, and the next four months or so, this is a topic which is going to be up front. I think many different Indias are being sought to be constructed by the AAP, the BJP, and the Congress. I think in the, during election time, once in five years, India reconstructs itself. And it's, it's the animism of our country. You know, fundamentally, we ask, you know, I, I live in Kolaba, so I need to go up and decide to vote. Should I vote for Milind Dura, his Congress? Historically, I voted Congress, but then he's a son of somebody, so that's against my meritocratic nature. Uh, who's the alternative? So there's a Shiv Sera person who stands for something which maybe the party I don't fully believe in, but this particular candidate who works, uh, does a very good job in the Kolaba slum, the half of Kolaba slums, as you know. So you keep at, at the voting booth, uh, you know, we, it's an interesting line which forms there in the Dunst Institute of School. There will be somebody like me in front of me will be the fruit seller. Then there, there will be a vegetable vendor. Then there's Ratham Tata above before that, and two, three others. You know, it's a great equalizer. The election is a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. So these are the moments we, we think: Who do I vote for? What do I stand for? From meritocracy versus party symbols. I don't know the clear answer, but I think uh, what is being Indian implies being very tolerant of uh, the six of us Indians are always found there are nine views on any topics and we are very comfortable with that you know mm -hmm. we are willing to accept are, are, are we comfortable are we comfortable because I think so which is why we argue so much against it <laughs> you are aren't we getting to be an angry nation and anger is such I, a I think it's a sign of passion that you care you, know, you can be like dumb as cattle and saying you know mm -hmm. with the arguments gone I think in almost any forum that we meet uh, there are these arguments, sometimes you can call it ranting, 
but most often you know, sit and have what in Canada they call under sessions. And you know, I think that's part of being Indian. You know, I am. Okay, so, so, so you, you, your, your, your view right now is India, being an Indian and the idea of India is more political. No, no, uh, no. if the discussion could be about rights of women, uh, what was it called? Coin the phrase, the argumentative Indian. Yeah, Amar yeah. Tesan. Correct, okay, something yeah. like that. So that's central to our existence and I hope that never changes. Okay, thanks, thanks Ajit. Uh, Kiran. Uh, what does the idea of India mean to you and what does it mean to be an Indian here today and now? Uh, to begin with, I hope you don't mind me calling you by your first names. Of to course we mind. Because you. there's so much senior to me in both achievements and That's not a nice thing I'm to say, to call somebody senior. Uh, achievements. <laughs> no, that's Clearly not. head and shoulders far, far ahead of me. So I'm really happy to be on a panel with uh, the two of you. But uh, for me, I kind of agree with Ajit. I was thinking about it after we had our conversation. And uh, uh, I think it's a much discussed subject that we, we um, sort of cohabit so many Indias at one time and, uh, and this, this diversity, while it's so complex, at the end of the day is also our great strength and is also something that I put personally take great pride in. So um, I think for me being Indian is, uh, is the idea of inclusion, the idea that um, all, all these discussions, all these arguments and all these points of view need to be uh, discussed need to be put on the table and need to be considered before we sort of take a decision on anything. And India cannot be looked at just through, say, the economic perspective of pink papers or uh, just a, you know, the, the political angle, like he said. We all, we, I have the same dilemmas when I go for elections every year, because do you vote for somebody who is doing a lot or do you vote for somebody whose party has more, is more your ideology? So it's a, it's a number of uh, issues that we deal with as Indians, I think every year and every day. And uh, I think for me, the idea of India and the idea of a robust India is one that that engages all these different points of view and, and uh, doesn't look on it as, you know, doesn't try to make it one singular uh, notion or one singular uh, identity. Yeah, uh, I think that's very well said because it can't be one notion, one identity. And many times I find myself asking, so whose India is it anyway? We'll come back to the India question later with you. Uh, Ajit, uh, talk to us a little bit about entrepreneurship. You know, the other day when we were talking about uh, you know, your recollection of this meeting this father of a young uh, graduate from IIM Calcutta uh, in your capacity as the, uh, the, the uh, chairman of the board of governors of IIM Calcutta. And you had a very fascinating perspective on uh, who's graduating today. Uh, what this meritocracy that you alluded to a little while ago about how that's transforming and uh, talk to us about the entrepreneur in New India as against the, uh, you know, the traditional view of what big business is all about. Well, the uh, little narrative that you uh, alluded to is something like this. During the convocation, um, and the guy who stands in a robe and you know, hands out diplomas to everybody, then, uh, 500 students graduate every year and the parents come. It's the first time you realize the super bike kid, and this is the parents you come from. Last year there was a case where there was a man standing aside uh, in a dhoti and vishri uh, from Andhra Pradesh and he barely spoke English, barely, but he wanted to shake my hands and with his wife and they're both in the 50s and the young bright son came and introduced his dad because his father didn't speak English. So I asked him, what do you do? And the father says, I have a three or four acre uh, plot of land in Andhra Pradesh where I grow dal. Okay. And this son who was graduating that day. He was one of the merit rank holders uh, from his father who was a small farmer. And he had just got a job with Morgan Stanley of $150,000. <laughs> You know, that's the new India. You know, people who, given a chance and given a meritocratic system like a CAT exam and dispassionate recruiting, I think education remakes in the Indian elite. You know? mm -hmm. So, and there was one more narrative. So, you know, um, just two weeks ago, I was on a flight, late night flight, Indigo from Delhi to Bombay. And I tell my secretary, always give me a seat around 20, 21, 22 minutes. You mix up and hear things. So, this youngster next to me with an iPad, 
playing some things. After a while, I asked him, you know, what do you do? He said, sir, I'm my sales representative for a company, <coughs> Eli Lilly, the company, mm -hmm. and his company had taken him to Delhi for a training program. So they asked him, what does your father do? And he says, my father is a taxi driver in Bombay. Wow. And I said, that's very nice. I didn't know what to say. Then uh, I said, but where do you guys come from? He said, Eastern UP. Dad came here in 87 or 88 or something in that period. And uh, that was the only job he could do. And he had educated both of his sons to college. And there was this kid. Fantastic. And another brother. So after a while, he asked about me. And I told him who I am. And then he said, I, as I was leaving, I said, I'm sure one day you will be CEO of Eli Lilly Worldwide. And he said, yeah. <laughs> Confidently, this is India too. I will come back to the entrepreneurship thing and I want to your reflection on that. But um, uh, before that, since we are having a nice flow of conversation here, Kiran, you talked about the derivative India and how uh, this is she talked about when we were having a conversation some time back. And she was talking about how for the first time, very first time since us becoming an independent country, or probably even older than that, as a nation, as a society, we are departing from being a derivative country. Tell us a little more about your thought on that. Well, uh, I, I sort of was growing up, I think, at a time when, uh, when we were still fairly colonial as a nation. And uh, I mean, I, I sort of, when I look at my education and I look at Calcutta back then, as Marxist as it was, it was, there was, you know, there was education and all our institutions were still fairly colonial. And, and um, all my references, for instance, are, not Indian references. So I, you know, very often felt that I don't really know my country well enough. I mean, I grew up in a, in a little bit of a bubble of Calcutta with, with being educated, being from a particular part of society. And, uh, and as I've, I, you know, as I, when I came to Bombay after, did my college here and came back to work here, I found that cable television, of course, had just started and, the, and, and had just picked up and Indian channels were now on air. And I could see the struggle to build a particular cultural identity for the youth of this nation through music channels, through um, you know, other, other kinds of uh, cultural spaces. And it was all fairly, um, I mean, it was all very interesting and exciting and a lot of use of kitsch, but there was a struggle to determine, it was always a little bit uh, of an um, amused look at India. So we were still on the outside. It was always a look at India with, which was tongue in cheek to say, oh, we are like this only, we do all these bizarre things. And let's accept ourselves. It was, it, was a, it was an interesting take and it was, I think, the first step to being able to admit that we have so many kinds of Indians. We have so many cultures that are ours and that may not be mine, may not be yours, but are ours. And, um, and from there, I feel we have now, in the last 10 to 15 years since I came to uh, Mumbai and started working, I, I feel that we have, we've, uh, we've accepted ourselves a lot more. We've, we've come to a place where I think we, can, we are beginning to explore the idea of culture as a people who are comfortable with who we are. I think it's the, about the, at least I feel it among the youth today that there isn't so much anxiety and angst so much about putting themselves in a space in the world, you know, that, you know, th this is what they're doing everywhere else, which is what happened, you know, when, when liberalization happened, people suddenly could spend money and there was money to be had and people could wear jeans and, you know, your uh, branded clothes. Uh, I think we've come now to a place where that anxiety has has slowly, I feel, uh, reduced, and and so there is there is a space now for us to be able to create culture from from a truly unique uh, position of being Indian in this on this world stage, which we are. We are very clearly. Uh, a, a country to be reckoned with, a country that the whole world is interested in, and a country that has an enormous legacy that sometimes becomes a big burden, but is actually 
greatly informs us as a as a cultural um, you know as a cultural nation. So um, so now I think we are in a position, and I think we are as youth today. I see it in in the youth today, defining a, a, an identity for ourselves that is truly unique and that is contemporary, that is that is uh, robust and contemporary in the world. And I think that's the most exciting thing about. I'm not saying that we are already producing. Um, cultural artifacts or producing, you know, wonderful things that are going to be of great significance. But this is the beginning, I think the beginning is to, to be able to situate yourself, to be able to feel that you belong in a place that is truly yours. So it's okay to be me? It's okay to be me. Okay, great. On that point, I'm sure there's a restlessness brewing in the minds of the audience. We will take a couple of questions from the audience and uh, you can raise the question. Uh, you know, the two panelists can respond, but please be very brief with your question and don't make a point of view, long point of view, because if you want to make a long point of view, uh, the Times of India will be happy to publish it to, to tomorrow's edition. Uh, so after that, I have a controversial question for both Kiran and Ajit, but for now, let me hold that. And so over to you. Um, so yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I just want to know, like you spoke about Indianness. What is the ideal uh, definition or maybe meaning of Indianness? As we've been influenced over the years by a lot of uh, exterior countries. So, what is Indianness according to both of you? You know, uh, there used to be a time when you said India, to be Indian meant being a Hindu. You know, that's not true. Okay. Uh, it never probably was. Now we are willing to acknowledge that. And at, at some state it meant whether you're fair skinned or dark skinned. If it was an African you segregate and you, you can't make out. Even the first names of young people have all become national, you know. Ajit and Kiran could be from any part of the world, any part of India. So I think um, what it's you know what is emerging in my head is um, an Indian is a person who can tolerate wide varieties of opinions, some contradictory with each other inside his head. Uh, I compare this to my friends in France or even Americans. Uh, they don't seem to be to be able to hold all that in their head at all times. Uh, secondly, we are, being Indian means learning to live with uh, people different from you. Because that is a fact when you go through school and college and neighbors. You have a wide variety. India is not as segregated a country as even America can be. If you know there for a while, you see that how it partitions our people by real estate prices. Mm -hmm. So I I I think um, the, the identity is emerging, and uh, nowadays a big battle is being fought to make sure the role of women is more equalized in our society. Uh, that is another. Uh, it's being done in such a forceful way with no other, my women friends in other parts of the world are astonished at some of our recent uh, legislation concerning that. So we are, you know, you know taking a country with a 2,000 year old tradition of uh, treating women not as well as we should have and within a period of one year accelerating it into the 21st century. So all of this is going on at this time and we are, I think, seem to be quite content with all this. Occasionally we get mad but, you know, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, I want the producer of Delhi Belly uh, and Dhobi Ghat <laughs> and Satyam Vajayate to be answering that question. You know, I don't think there's any one definition of Indianness which I'm sure everybody will agree with. Um, we are too diverse a nation and each and every one of us is a product of such different circumstances that we d define it for ourselves. I think the fact that we belong in India and we are each of us different is, like Ajit said, just the, the definition of Indianness, that we, we just belong to this country full of different, different languages, different uh, ideologies, different political points of view. Um, I mean, as far as the youth go, I think the, uh, the uh, I would say that the way for you to define yourself as an Indian would be to do things that you're, you're interested in and comfortable doing from the space that you come from. I've struggled with it a lot in my own work uh, in that I find that I'm an urban 
animal. I have never grown up in a village. I've had, I think, one of the more entitled upbringings of, and most of us in this room I would consider entitled because we live in big cities. We have such amenities as power and water at the turn of a tap and things like that. So I, I don't know the realities of so many other Indians. So that sometimes I question my own Indianness if you want to put it like that. But I think wearing a nine yard sari and you know knowing Bharatnatyam is not necessarily make doesn't necessarily make you more Indian. Um, I think it's how you engage with other Indians, engage with the idea of India and the, the problems that we go through. Engaging politically with this country, I think, would would be how Indian you are. Uh, we can be in a bubble of New York within India, or we could actually engage with the realities of other Indians. Uh, and I think that would be the critical thing that the youth need to do, is engage with all the other Indians, uh, while they are comfortable being in their own India. I mean, you're comfortable driving, driving a car on the streets of Bombay, and that's very valid. But we must know that there are people who, you know, have uh, have none of the things that we have. So I, I would use, you know, that to actually start whenever one questions how Indian we are or how Indian I am, for instance. Thank you. So how inclusive and how empathetic you are. Exactly. It's empathy. Sir, go ahead. Somehow I get a feeling that we are becoming highly argumentative society. Whether you watch a TV program by Arnav or all the 600 channels and the newspaper. The second aspect is somehow I think we are putting too much of negativity in our media, newspaper. Because my sons who are based in US and now they come here, they say, say Dad, why so much of things are reported negatively? When you open the newspaper, you find everything negative. But in abroad, I'm told it's not so bad. So can we do something to uh, bring some moderation, some change in the way we look at things and we report? That is my question. <coughs> His question, you know, I, I'll paraphrase that a little bit. You know, he's talking about this excessive negativity. Yes, and uh, he talks about, you know, you open the newspaper, argumentativeness. Uh, he, he named yes. somebody who had no name here. Okay. And then he said, uh, that why is it that we are so argumentative? Why so much of bad news? Let me modify that statement. You know, isn't the film industry also responsible for amplifying that? Absolutely. I'm bad news. Yeah, bad news. I thought our, our cinema is largely so escapist. How are we modify? How are we <laughs> amplify it? Unfortunately, we don't even really address what's going on in much of our country in our cinema today. That's my big problem. But so I don't feel we amplify it enough. But, you know? but, but isn't a uh, lot that is happening in cinema uh, getting uh, to be mimicked? Mm -hmm. And there is a you know if you go to interior India today. Uh, suddenly, you know, violence is becoming mainstream and violence is becoming very macho and violence is becoming very heroic, yeah, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So, is there an angle to it? Am I discovering a question or would you yeah. think that? So, I, think okay. so, I would like to, uh, I'll just address what Shubhato said uh, first. You know, Shubhato, I feel that, you know, we went through a whole phase of extremely violent cinema in the 80s with, you know, all the, uh, one man beating. Yes, the, 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 yeah, and and you know even even the 90s actually for some period with Sunny Deol and all the action heroes and one guy beating up many people and usually it was always a fight of uh, you know a, a street guy beating up goons or a poor man beating up a villain etc. So so there was always a, ideologically it was always balanced the right way but of course violence is. Uh, was always there. And I think violence continues to be there in cinema across the world. I'm not a great uh, admirer or proponent of uh, violent films. Um, I would say our films are actually highly non-violent compared to say Korean films or the films of other Southeast Asian countries where I mean, uh, I mean it's, it's, it's extremely graphic and gruesome and, and uh, in fact uh, many films in the West as well even even uh, uh, films made by well-known people such as the Coen brothers, they have very, very violent films. Now I think if you go, if you go into the, it a little bit and step away from the argument that films automatically influence behavior, I'm not, I don't agree with that. I don't think films, uh, it's, it's not such a direct chain of uh, influence or reaction. Uh, I, my, my feeling on that is, is that we need to think about uh, why is, for instance, the news in our papers bad? And why is there violence in our films? And 
for instance, why do we have such bad TV serials? Uh, why, why are they, you know, uh, when, we, when we actually introspect about that, I think we need, we, we, we come back to the point that, especially when it comes to the newspapers, there are pretty bad things happening in our country. The violence is among the, one, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one of the things that we speak about the least but it's there in almost every household, maybe not in certain elite entitled households where we don't have the struggle of every day getting, a, you know, getting our meals. But when I look at my own household and the women who work for me, they are all, without exception, uh, you know, victims and survivors of violence in their own homes. They are single women bringing up children in extremely violent conditions. They live in, they live in a society where more often than not, they have no uh, no access to redressal, no access to security. So they have to uh, actually comply with certain societal norms, otherwise they will not be given uh, security by the state. So they are part and they have to be complicit with certain social um, you know, requirements for them. That they, they, they have to be a certain way. And this is in big cities like Mumbai. So, so violence is part of everyday life. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, we are, I think, um, um, insulated from it, being in, from a particular part of society. But to my mind, it's one of the things that's, that's uh, uh, now being reported more and more, and therefore shocking us more and more, because I think, say, 20, 25 years ago, uh, reportage wasn't as much, and I think editors and people who were part of the media elite would, would not want so much violence to be reflected in the paper. So I, all I'd like to say is that, sir, it is a reality today. We read more every single day in the paper. We read about rape and people being killed and you know um, hunger, starvation, and it is our reality. So I think for, for the first, we have to step up and accept it, despite the fact that it gives a very negative impression of India abroad. I, according to me, let's not think about what people think of us abroad. I think that's very secondary. They don't live here and they can think what they like. It's important what we think about ourselves. What does it say about us as people that every day in the paper we wake up and read this? That a 16-year-old girl is gang raped. What does it say about us as a nation? And, and that needs to be reported. If it's not reported, you and I won't talk about it. And if you and I don't talk about it, it there's a chance that it will go unspoken for the next few generations, and I don't think we want that to happen. Yeah, on, on that note, Ajit, uh, yeah, I, I, is I there a need to, to this. I want to add something to this question, because I, this has been preoccupying me for a while. So I did some research across all <clears throat> people I knew in television and print, and one of the things that I am starting to believe is that journalists believe, Indian journalists believe that such stories sell. It's a very fundamental assumption. I, they tell this to me in confidence after the fourth raid. Uh, on television, it is believed that, in, particularly English language television, believes that such stories, particularly about corruption in high places, uh, sales. Um, I interviewed some of our own journalists in my own company, and they have similar views that some such stories apparently are welcomed by the middle class. And I, that when I went on a hunt to see why should that be so, the underlying sociology looks something like this. The Indian middle class, which includes certainly all of us, and um, is going through an angst period today. Mm -hmm. And the angst arises because you open uh, a newspaper on a particular day, uh, Times of India, Hindustan Times, where you live, on the right side is ads for apartments which cost four crores and five crores. And on the left side of the same page are stories about 2G scam, cold scam. Mm -hmm. And the average middle class person whose standard of life is eroding compared to his parents, mm -hmm. how they live, looks at this and says, I'm a hardworking person. How is how these apartments, how I on earth can I even it's, think of owning an apartment? I'm a journalist, for example, five crores and four crores. And I look to the left and see the corruption story. I concatenate the two and say, people who can afford such things must be corrupt. Yeah. And that, that is the angst in India's middle class. I'm seeing it much more in Delhi when I, when I go once a week. Yeah. Much less in Bombay. In Bombay, we tend to think there is a problem where we need to work hard enough and make some money. In Delhi, they say government must be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Government must have something to do with this contradiction that I live. 
You, I, I think there is a middle class angst in the country. Well, uh, you, I don't know if it's just middle class though, because if you look at the same story, which is very valid that you're talking about, gets published in every vernacular medium, and the taxi driver is reading that story and demanding to know why not me, and the uh, chai stall guy in rural Maharashtra is sharing the Marathi newspaper along with 10 people, because the village is what happens is 10 people will read the same newspaper and sometimes the same uh, glasses are also passed around you know, for the elderly people. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cascading problem, a big problem. And we could stay on this subject for the rest of the day, but we also have positive time. Ma'am, you go next. No. <laughs> the lady in the Euro Sari there. Ajit, I just want to make a clarification. It's not just Indian journalists who think that way. This is a worldwide thing. You are supposed to report the crime, the corruption, the rape, the whatever it is to highlight it. Uh, that's just point number one. Uh, Kiran, this one's for you. Um, uh, you talked about the media, about the television and films that are making, uh, creating this new culture that we're more comfortable with. What do you think of the impact of the new literature that's come out? You know, the Chetan Bhagats, Amish Tripathis and all. What sort of impact have they had on us finding our own, being comfortable in our own skin? Right. You know, actually, when I talk, to, uh, talk about uh, television and film, I want to make a clarification there. I think we are creating content that's probably more reflect, reflective of us as a people. It's, uh, it's a bit scary for me because I don't, um, I don't actually subscribe to a lot of what comes on uh, fiction, television, or, for instance, on uh, screens as films. But certainly, yes, there are. There, there's a lot more of us in our movies, and I, I'm happy to say that even in um, in big mainstream Hindi, Tamil, etc., different kinds of different language films of India, there is um, there. There is, a, there is a sense that there is not just a sort of a um, standardized formulaic story of hero. Uh, and there is a little more subtlety coming through, whether it's a regional, you know, regional stories or stories, different women characters. I, I do feel that it's growing, so I do feel they're getting there. It's certainly nowhere close to where I hope it will get. But um, again, I think in literature, I have to admit that I've not read enough uh, of the best-selling Indian authors. But, uh, but from, from what I read of their success, and especially uh, Amish Tripathi sort of uh, taking, you know, pretty much piggybacking on Indian myth and legend and, you know, sort of uh, converting it into this exciting, new, modern sort of fantasy, um, is again a step in that direction where, where you know, the stories that we maybe just before my generation have heard since they've been growing up, they look at again in a different light. It's all exciting again, and it's uh, it's you know it, it's become relevant. It's become contemporary. So um, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a time that uh, if people have the space to do more things of their kind, of that kind, and I think entrepreneurship and the way in Indian business models have changed. Writers, T-shirt designers, you know, people who sell uh, you know different things online have have created new and more uh, contemporary cultures for us to you know go back to and reference. So we'll come to you now. So your time is now, but. Uh, let me ask you something. You know, how many of you are here who are less than 25 years of age? Okay, people in the back. Oh my God, this is amazing. So that two 25-year-olds to ask questions, which need not be boring, need not be intellectual. Okay, need not be serious stuff. It can be any question. You know, we uh, retain the right to answer, not to answer. A personal, professional, anything. So you could ask a question to Kiran and a question to Ajit. But before that, Miss, you go. Hello. My question to you all is, the topic says India, our time is now. We see it's been a paradigm shift from the time of um, independence, uh, socially, culturally, even technologically. So, but then what is one thing that pulls us back right now? According to both of you all, what is the one problem that India faces uh, as a country. You know, you know I, I'm not sure there is anything which is keeping us back. 
Uh, right now, the whole world is going through an economic recession. I, I promise you that the problems that we have here is 1%. Some of my friends in England and France, they, they look at the future and say the future is a dark wall. They see no hope. What is the hope for a country like England when they look into the next 10 years? They bet everything on financial services uh, in London and that is imploded never to rise again to this extent. What do the French do? They, uh, three people are doing work for one person through their social system. So I think compared to them, we have everything in the future looks super bright to me. As usual, we'll have six of us will have 10 views on how we will achieve that future. There will be, they do not worry, I think. That's how our film and media and print industry stay alive by telling us which way to go. And there are severe challenges too, because um, part of it, I think, honestly, there is a middle class angst, partly because government has stopped recruiting for the last 10 years. The government used to be the main job provider for the Indian middle class. The nationalized banks have stopped recruiting and so on. Our IT services people saved us from 1991 to 2007, and they have paused a little bit. Uh, you know, the scale at which we do things, Sometimes, since I'm connected to the education sector, I can tell you, and nobody can get this right. Do you have any idea in the last decade how many colleges have gone open in India? Put it, throw a number at me. How many new colleges have opened in India in the last 10 years? Colleges, work calling colleges? Or colleges, colleges. <laughs> colleges. <laughs> you know, colleges as accredited universities, I'm not talking of that. 20,000 colleges. Last year alone, India opened 3,000 colleges in one year. That's the scale. So a big challenge then is to see how do you deliver quality education without becoming over-legislating on that, without meeting out criminal penalties as we normally do for, you know, teachers don't teach, put them in jail, that kind of stuff. So we have the scale problems. Everywhere you have scale problems in education, in healthcare. So how to master the scale issue is I think, and I think the, some of the messages make learning may come from IT services companies, many of whom very comfortably recruit 20,000 people in one year and deploy them and make them work well. So some of the answers may also come. So I think dealing with the whole scale issue is, uh, I think, the, the big thing. I, uh, I actually defer in that I think uh, one thing that's holding us back is, the, is, our, is our education is our kind of education. I think we need education, we need to reform education and we have to change it right from the very primary level upwards because we, you know, people who benefit from this kind of education are people like me who come from literate backgrounds, who are able to mug up reams and reams of information and I, I think what's therefore holding us back is we have youth who are bright, who are desperate to take on the world to do so much, but are not equipped with an education that teaches them to be inventive, to be innovative, to interpret the world around them in their own ways. And that, I think, is our big, big challenge. Because despite that, thanks to just, I think, the sheer, um, you know, um, just just the fact that they're just talented and want, want to, you know, the need and the desire to perform and to do things makes Indians still so entrepreneurial, so uh, risk-taking and, you know, and our sheer, by our sheer numbers we become that many more. But if we had an, uh, an education that was relevant to our realities today as a diverse country that actually encouraged people to uh, be innovative and create things, to change to sh their different points of view were actually encouraged rather than, you know, please produce exactly what was there in the textbook verbatim so that, you know, you get 100%. Uh, education, uh, you know, sort of analysis of how a child is done wasn't done on this mark system, but on, on a child's ability to interpret, taking into, taking into account that a child has so many intelligences and can do so many different things and acad academia is one part of it, you know. So um, once we have an education that does that, we, nobody can stop us as a nation. We are we're just waiting to take off, according to me. If we had teachers and we had an education system that, that encouraged people to, you know, to fulfill their own individual potential. Subject to 2014 elections, just so take the <laughs> Now, uh, 
25 year olds fun question no serious stuff you have a fun question to ask kiran or rajit i teach business and management i have this is not a planted thing okay <laughs> absolutely not planted i have never seen it before thank you So I teach business and management, and I've also used MBA 16 in class to encourage them to be entrepreneurial. So my question to you is, how do you think we can encourage the youth to be uh, to instill the values of entrepreneurship? Because we have so many problems across the country, and like you know, reaching villages and reaching all these different cases and solving different problems needs that entrepreneurial <coughs> spirit. So how do you think we can inculcate that among students? Um, So the the thing that she is talking about is a book I wrote for 16 year olds, Colombia at 16. Uh, this happened after I worked with 31 kids, 14 girls and 17 boys, all 16, uh, over a three month period to see what's going on in their mind about the world of business, and then wrote this little book. But the fun thing is that that book is now getting translated to, you know, other Indian languages. But on her question about entrepreneurship. I want both of you to really reflect on this. And I see you, and of course, Amir. I respect him as an entrepreneur, uh, and you represent the creative economy. Actually, and by the way, uh, to just give a glimmer of hope to the Britishers, um, you know, Ajit talked about the fading financial economy. The one sector which is growing uh, higher than the GDP in Britain is the creative economy. and they are trying to rope in creative people from all over the world because they see that that could be a big advantage for britain in the years to come and they're saying that look you know if you put together spice girls a band like some spice girls you don't need acs at land at the height of their performance they were a billion dollar entity billion dollar entity this is that's non trivial but over to uh, kiran first Uh, you know, talk to us about becoming an entrepreneur and what does it mean in the creative economy, in the kind of work that you do, and of course, uh, Ajit, who was an entrepreneur even before, long before I became an entrepreneur. So Ajit, love to hear your views on that, particularly for young people. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't have much entrepreneurial experience myself, but all I know is creative people have to be entrepreneurial. They have to know how to sell their ideas. They have to know how to get out there and. Uh, get whatever they want done, whether you're a writer or a painter or a filmmaker or a, any any creative person. And because entrepreneurship, at the end of the day, is creative. It is the ability to create an idea that people can want, can want, can consume, can desire, and uh, and hopefully need as well. It's not just uh, you know hot air. But um, but you know I think the problems again facing. Uh, if I if you just go back to what I said about Indian education, if you if you've survived it and you covered with uh, ideas that that you know you would like. to share with the world then i think the only real problem in this country is the lack of um, is the lack of structure uh, i find it especially in my own industry which is which which was of course declared an industry far too late and was you know was literally the 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 product of the you know hard work and vision of regular individual some people who had come to bombay after partition you know and not a bunch of people who put in their own money and their own land with no help from any government uh, and you know were expected to do great things they were just regular people they had no cii no uh, business you know uh, acumen in that sense no backing from anyone so when i see our own industry i i see it and i was ashamed to say the most um, i mean it's it's the most crippling thing in our industry is any lack of organization and structure well, you know right. well not 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 enough in the sense that today if someone wants to actually join the film industry they have to know somebody they have to go through a particular channel of uh, okay let's let's keep hanging out outside you know shot films and try to make friends with x y and z so i can get in and therefore get a job so you're so discouraging to us soon well well you know i'm uh, i'm putting the scenario forward so that she can see how she can deal with it because we change it you know we don't capacity. totally want to change it i mean this is we 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 are hoping to do it it's again uh, uh in this film industry it's a very complex thing so i don't want to go into it because there's so many film industries across the country so even if we just look at the mumbai film industry it's complex enough because each and every person who's made even a tiny little short film is a producer 
So we have millions of producers in this in this city and state alone. So to actually get them to actually become part of a body and then look at the future of cinema and not just what will pay their bills tomorrow is a is a complex thing. So I just feel that that is the only thing that uh, is a problem. I think it's a hurdle in entrepreneurship in in my sector especially, but I, I assume in other places it's access. Yeah, we we are all part of this uh, is a, of this yeah, make effort. A, make a film on entrepreneurs. <laughs> okay, you know when you discuss entrepreneurship in India, most people assume <coughs> India has very few entrepreneurs. It is accurately not true. You define entrepreneurship and the opposite of it as being a salaried employee. Salaried employees in India are only 18% of the working. All others, 82% are on their own. They could be somebody who's a domestic servant on their own, or it could be small business. Uh, and you also find this pattern saying people from quote unquote business community seem to, you know, be the majority of entrepreneurs. And we think that there's something in their blood genes. No such thing. No such thing. Uh, it, the, re the real reason is the availability of capital in an organized way is a problem. It's an acute problem in the film industry. Some of my friends are ad filmmakers, so tangentially I know that industry. Uh, typically what happens is if you start and you want 10 lakhs of rupees to take make your first venture and your parents don't have it. If you come from a business community, they have ways of financing this. But if you come from a middle class family like mine and your dad is a doctor, um, then he doesn't have the money to give you. There is no way, the Indian tax system does not favor, let's say, for me to invest in a startup venture and if that fails, that to be written off. So some of us, including myself, are pushing the finance ministry very, very hard uh, one step we have had a success, which is to create a limited liability f partnership firm. That bill got passed after five years of pushing. That's one very, very important thing. The second piece is to make sure that if I, as a passive partner, invest in a partnership uh, firm that one of you have started, and you chance that nine out of ten you will fail, that's a rate for entrepreneurship throughout the world. And if my, you lose that business, and I have to write it off. Today, under Indian income tax law, it is virtually impossible for me to write my 10 lakhs off. Whereas in the United States, I can write the full 10 lakhs off immediately. Mm -hmm. So these kind of institutional arrangements are needed to create early stage financing. Well, you can't go to a bank. Your risk rate is too high to start up. So no bank would say, we'll pledge your grandfather's how they'll give you money. So we don't want that, right? So I think we have to look at the institutional connections. And I think even in our film industry, I think in the in the 60s and 70s, I think smugglers were financing most of it because nobody else would. Pardon me? Yeah, because nobody else would risk the capital. Inherently, a creative product like a film, chance of sex is what? One in ten? Absolutely. At best. And this is true in software. It is true in anything creative. So I think we have to fix the institutional arrangements for it. And some of us are pushing hard and please join the... Join. Thank you, Rajat. Actually, uh, I don't mean to cut it short, but uh, this has been an amazing co conversation. Let's have one question from under 25 years. Maybe you talk about much of India. Then I want to know your idea about India versus Bali. How can you differentiate India versus Bali? Wow. <laughs> These are big, big issues. And the fact that at this young age you're reflecting about it, it makes me so thrilled. Fantastic. Actually, I want to say something. Ajit, you're absolutely right. You know, in making this distinction, Sandeep, Sandeep right? We are, we are doing ourselves a disservice. Because we are Bharat. We are Bharat and India. Yes. Each of us is Bharat and India, and until we feel like that, we will never be one nation. We will I, always I, have Bharat I, and I, versus I, India. There's no versus. We are both. Each of us is both. You know, I have a point to make on this. <clears throat> In cricket, up until 1982, India used to lose every cricket match. And, you know, and there were people who, Oxford educated, Nawab of Khatardi, all people from St. Stephen's College and Maharaja's College and so on and so forth. Then at Kapil, they were right. And he spoke barely in English, if you ask him, you know, and at 83 he spoke barely in English. You couldn't make a speech after the team won. That so-called Bharat, the creature from Bharat is what took India to success. 
That's the difference. Okay, on the Lagan note, uh, thank you for that lovely question. And first and foremost, I think we need to thank uh, Kumar and his stellar team to have even thought about something like a non-fiction lit fest. May India read more non-fiction. And on behalf of all of us here on this stage, thank you to Sandeep and every member in the audience. And from my side, Kiran, thank you so much, Ajit. Thank you.